Welcome to Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. Each week we'll walk you through the Epicurean text and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. We're now in the middle of a series of podcasts intended to provide a general overview of Epicurean philosophy based on the organizational structure employed by Norman DeWitt in his book, Epicurus and His Philosophy. Now let's join the discussion. Welcome to episode 168 of Lucretius Today. We're starting a new chapter, chapter 10, entitled The New Freedom. And it's a very big and important topic that's not necessarily evident from the title, but Essentially, what we'll be dealing with in this section is a subject of great importance to Epicurus, which we generally today talk about in terms of determinism, the issue being whether we have any ability at all as human beings to influence the course of our actions and our futures, or whether we are basically the playthings of the gods or of fate or some other forces that are totally outside our control. And as usual with Epicurus, his position ends up being one that some people might call a common sense and practical position, but it's a very detailed and emotional question for some people. Over the years in our discussions of Epicurean philosophy on the internet, this is probably one of the issues that has caused the most division and emotional angst among uh, people who like many aspects of Epicurus, but there are some aspects of him that they just cannot go along with. And this issue of determinism has many applications in many aspects of life that make it an important one to discuss. Epicurus addresses it in several aspects of his writings. It's a significant part of his letter to Menorchius. There are references in the Vatican sayings and aspects of the principal doctrines. It's in Lucretius. It relates to one of his most famous doctrines, the swerve in certain ways. And so it's something that we ought to talk about in general, about why it's important before we get into some of the details about it. One of the most significant passages in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar relates to Cassius Longinus, who was about to become involved at the time of this quote in the plot to assassinate Julius Caesar. And there's a discussion between Cassius and Brutus that touches on this issue. Since our resident expert in Shakespeare is Joshua, I'd ask him to pull that up and bring that to our attention. A resident expert that might be stretching things. But yeah, this comes from Julius Caesar, Act 1, Scene 2, and it goes like this. Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. We could talk about that because it's a good example of the practical application of a philosophical position. This is relatively early in the play, and Julius Caesar has risen to power. He has had several episodes in which Mark Anthony and others are asking him to proclaim himself king of Rome. And the senatorial class of which Cassius and Brutus and Cicero and many others were part were extremely unhappy about that. This is an example of how difficult politics can be to deal with as well, because I have no personal opinion as to which side was correct in that conflict. Apparently, Rome had been going through a lot of upheaval. Julius Caesar was to some extent putting a stop to that. But he was putting a stop to it by approaching a status of being a king, which the ancient Romans had always rejected from the very beginning of the founding of the Roman Republic. You had the first Brutus, who was the ancestor of the Brutus that we're talking about today, who had been involved in the assassination of Tarquin, which set up the Roman Republic in the first place. And from that time on, the Romans had a lot of antipathy towards kings and refused to have one of their own. But now Julius Caesar was bringing order to a very revolutionary civil war almost environment within Rome, and the people who were in power did not necessarily like that. So this episode is people who are looking at a problem and deciding whether they have the ability to influence it or not, whether everything is just ordained by the fates, by the gods to happen, and that they just have to stand idly by and watch it or whether they can or should take any action to try to influence the course of events. 
Brutus is identified as being sort of a Platonist. He's not a Stoic, as some people think. And there's a very good article by David Sedley on this exact issue, The Ethics of Brutus and Cassius. And here in this situation, Cassius, as an Epicurean, is looking at Brutus and saying that men are at some times masters of their fates, which is a reflection almost of what's in the letter to Menorchius, that some things are in our control and some things are not. And then he says specifically, the fault, dear Brutus, if we don't take any action, if we just sit here and do nothing, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we're underlings, that we're not willing ourselves to take action that is possible to us. So Cassius, as a representative who had converted to Epicurean philosophy, is expressing directly to Brutus an Epicurean theme, which we're going to be talking about today. The philosophical point is, is you do have intruding into day-to-day -day life the question of whether you have any control at all or whether the stars, the astrology crowd, or just religion in general, the fates, who even the Greeks, I think, thought that the gods themselves were subject to the fate. The, the gods in ancient Greece, they're definitely not above it all. And the issue of fate for the Greeks in their literature was one of the oldest tropes, particularly in their drama. And I'm glad we have Don with us today, because Don, I think you've read a lot more Greek drama than I have. But I guess the essential story of, for example, the Oedipus cycle is this idea that no matter how hard you run, you cannot outrun your fate. And I've told this story before on the podcast, but I'll try to be very brief. It's called Appointment in Samara. And there's a master who sends his servant to the marketplace to buy goods. And the servant comes running back to the house of the master with no goods. <laughs> the master says, what happened? And he said, I was at the market and I felt something behind me. I turned around and I beheld the face of death. And the master said, I'll, I'll go to the market and, and, and see what happened. But before I do that, you take the fastest horse we have and make for far off Samara to escape death. And so the master sends him on the horse and then he goes to the market and confronts death and says, w w what is the meaning of this playing pranks upon my servant? And, and death says, I didn't mean to play a prank on him. I was, I was actually very surprised because I have an appointment with your servant in the far off town of Samara tomorrow. <laughs> so it's, it's again, this, this idea, which is very old in human consciousness, this idea that no matter how far you run, you cannot outrun your destiny. Yeah, Oedipus was always going to marry his mother and kill his father, no, no matter no matter what he did. So yeah, and it, it's almost as if the events that people took, or the actions that people took around him, far from preventing the fate, it seemed like they actually pushed it to its final conclusion. Exactly, exactly. This idea that there is a fate that overrides everything else is an extremely important issue. We'll come back to it, later, but that's what's in the letter to Menorchius. Epicurus is certainly identified with being against the idea of worshiping supernatural gods and thinking that they're going to reward you or punish you. But as much as he's against that, he says it's preferable to believe in that than it is to believe in what amounts to fate or hard determinism, that nothing you can do can control what happens to you in the future. He says that that is such a bad thing. He even says explicitly that it's worse to believe that you're hopelessly subject to fate than to believe in supernatural gods who might help you, because at least if you are praying to supernatural gods, you think there's a possibility that they'll actually help you, whether you're right or wrong. But if you believe in inexorable fate, which is, again, part of the Virgil quote that we talked about last week, happy was he who was able to understand the nature of things. Happy is he who was able to know the causes of things and who has trampled beneath his feet all fear, inexorable fate, and the din of the devouring underworld. And so of all the things that Virgil could think of to say about presumably Lucretius, the triumph over fate was one of the things that he mentioned as most significant. Yeah, and that's one of the things that seems to strike me about the Stoics is that they're all about fate. You know, it's like embrace your fate or whatever that tagline is for them. Amor fati, I believe, is the Latin, because from the Stoic view, as I understand it, Everything happens for a reason. We will not necessarily know those reasons, but we just have to accept our fate and take advantage of the things that, that our attitudes towards the things that happen to us rather than actually taking action, it seems. Although it's a weird that if you're supposed to love your fate, then it's they're still very much striving for politics and that sort of thing and involvement. It seems like a weird dichotomy that Stoics have going on that they're supposed to just accept their fate, but then they're supposed to, you know, struggle against the world and rah, 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 rah. 
that seems to have to me a very religious sound to it. Why would you accept your faith and love it unless you thought there was some divine will behind it? Right. I seem to be on the theme of mentioning this from Emily Austin recently, but I like the way she describes how in an Epicurean framework, you don't have the religious point of view that everything works together for good for those who love the Lord is one of the biblical verses. Because if you think that God is in control of everything, if you're a Calvinist, if you think that everything that's happened from the beginning of time was ordained by God, then no matter how horrible an event happens to you, you can just look at it and say, tra-la-la, this is what God intended, so therefore I'm happy that it happened, because I love God, I love fate, and so therefore bring it on, send all the torture and torment and terrible things that you want, because I know that's God's will. Well, it, it's not even God's will, it's God's will, but you look at a, at a, and now we're getting really off on a tangent, but you look at a book like Job, where basically God exactly. comes off as just a capricious, you know, I do it because I want to do it, and how dare you question me, you know? That's the kind of God that is portrayed in the in the book of Job. It's like, <laughs> that's a little off-putting. <laughs> it, Don, exactly. I'm so glad you mentioned that, because that's one thing I remember from my childhood when I was being brought up in a religious environment. That's what the book of Job is about, that this man of God who had been blessed in so many different ways in terms of having all these flocks and wives and children and at the height of his success, the devil just walks up to God and says, well, he loves you because you've made him successful. If you took away his success, he wouldn't love you anymore. And so this arbitrary and capricious God just decides to just destroy everything that Job has as a test yeah. or as to, to sort of please Satan to right. just bring us all to a head. And so there's no lesson of the book of Job other than that the will of God is inscrutable to us and we just yeah. have to love what just happens. Shut up and take you know, it. Shut up and take it. I kept thinking that and, there must be some message behind it beyond that. Go ahead, Joshua. And that he gets very, very angry if you if you question it. That's the exactly. other side yes. of Yes. Yeah. How dare where were you, you question when me? I laid, yeah. Yeah. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You're nothing to me, mortal. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. There's this an all-loving not... and all-powerful God for you. Uh, hey. <laughs> So it isn't just a matter of astrology and trying to predict the future. That's something else that I don't know that we really bring it into this discussion in Chapter 10, but Epicurus was on record as being against divination. I believe the point was that divination is not true, but that even if it were, you wouldn't want to do it or something like that for this reason that we're talking about in terms of it's important to do what you can to make a better life. Yeah, it seems like, you know, Epicurus talks a lot about, you know, being against fate and you know, not seeing fate as, as entering into the, the life of an Epicurean. And it seems that he says explicitly that things that happen can have three causes. So there, you know, some things happen by necessity, some things happen by chance, and then others are up to us, is the, the literal literal Greek there at the end. So the parhemos, you know, the things that are up to us. And that's where the, the whole idea of you know, freedom and free will happen. And he talks about, you know, necessity and chance. You know, of course, some some things happen because of that. But it is not, you know, necessarily that there are some things that are literally up to us in the end that we can have power over what we decide to do. And why don't we at that point, Don, and what you just brought up is probably time to talk about one of the controversial aspects of the fact that right in there that you've just quoted from is where Epicurus talked that these issues that are within our control and the choices we make in regard to that are where issues of praise and blame right. arise. And of course, without going too far in that direction, because we want to cover all of this before we come to some conclusions, but... Certainly, there's an important issue involved in terms of how much is really under your control, right. and therefore, how much do you blame or do you praise somebody for doing something? All of us have many, many examples where we can talk about people who have been under incredibly unfortunate circumstances. I don't know why this comes to my mind. Les Miserables, the theme of that is where somebody is stealing some bread to feed his child or something like that. And the theme of it is how this policeman is constantly pursuing the hero to persecute him because he's broken the law, he's stolen. It doesn't matter that he's stolen in order to provide bread for his hungry child. It's just a matter of the law is the law, and you never have any exceptions to it. And so you have very complicated issues of blame and praise that go along with what you're responsible for and what you're not. 
But in the end, Epicurus is saying some things are in your control and some things are not. And that those things that are within your control are certainly things that you should be engaged in. You have to have the ability to control your experience. But once you know that you have some ability to influence or control your experience, that's where all these other doctrines about choice and avoidance and natural and necessary and all the different practical advice comes in. You are going to act prudently to take steps to enhance your happiness once you understand that, in fact, you do have that power to influence your future. Yeah, and this whole idea of the, the new freedom here in the, the DeWitt chapter really digs into the debates on free will and determinism and indeterminism, and then you get into the modern discussions about compatibility and responsibility. And I started reading some more into this last night, and it is just a rabbit hole down which one cannot extricate themselves. And there is a hot and heavy debate, even in, in modern philosophy, going on about free will and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting subject, but boy, is it convoluted and complex. Yeah. One thing I want to say there about the rabbit hole is you certainly cannot just pursue this rabbit to its end because you'll never come up for air. But one other reference aside from, of course, we're talking about Chapter 10 in this podcast. But I would strongly urge anybody interested in this subject to find the article by David Sedley entitled Epicurus's Refutation of Determinism. I think his conclusions are largely consistent with what DeWitt is talking about here. But one particularly interesting thing about that article is that Sedley talks about some more recently discovered Herculaneum texts. In fact, some that he himself has been involved in reconstructing that are not included in what DeWitt did back in the 1950s. And there's some really fascinating material that Sedley comes up with, including some things that I'm going to insist that we talk about before this chapter is over. The one theme there that I'll mention is that there's a parallel here between Epicurus's refutation of determinism versus Epicurus's refutation of skepticism. He considers both of them, radical skepticism and radical determinism, to be significant problems. And it's very interesting to read Sedley's analysis of how Epicurus combines a physics approach, but, but perhaps more so it's a logical argument about the inconsistencies of the skepticism argument and the determinism argument. Sedley does an excellent job of bringing out that I don't get we get into here in chapter 10 of Duet. One of the items that DeWitt brings up is a fourth kind of necessity that Epicurus was against was dialectical. For example, when the disjunctive proposition, tomorrow her Marcus will either be alive or dead, was put up to Epicurus, he declined to give an answer. He was too wary a dialectician himself to swallow a dialectical bait. That's maybe what we talk about in terms of hypothetical questions sometimes. There are those of us on this podcast who are more resistant to discussing <laughs> hypothetical questions than others are, but every hypothetical question runs into the same issues. What are the specific facts that are being taken as part of the premise of the question? Because by abstracting it out and ignoring the context, you create contradictions and conclusions that are not really supported in reality. My understanding of the Hermarchus issue is that Epicurus was observing that there is no necessity that Hermarchus either be alive or dead tomorrow, and that therefore, because there's no necessity that would lead you to a conclusion one way or the other, he said the right answer to the question was to say, I'm not even going to entertain it, or something to that effect. Anybody have right. a take on that? Yeah, I, th I think you put that pretty well, yeah. Okay, so the problem here, which is something I did study at college but don't remember much of, is what's called the explosive fallacy or the principle of explosion. If you go to Wikipedia and Google principle of explosion, it is a problem in logic. And the Latin phrase is ex falso sequitur quad libet. From falsehood, anything follows. Is the law according to which any statement can be proven from a contradiction? That is, once a contradiction has been asserted, any proposition, including their negations, can be inferred from it. This is known as deductive explosion. And there's more on it there, but this is like very high level logic here and something that I'm not really equipped to deal with. But it'll be something that'll be good to talk about on the forum, I think. Yes, so I have some comments on this one. So first of all, 
The key thing about this one is logic does not apply to, to anything on the real world in the future. So logic, at least as, so far as we, we, we know logic, né? and as we know time, there is no way to apply logic to the future. Logic does not apply to future statements on the real world. Logic applies very well to timeless statements, like all of mathematics, essentially a collection of timeless statements put together in a logical way. But we are talking about the real world, and there already we have a lot of difficulties in how to apply logic in the real world. What definitely doesn't work is apply logic to future events. And another thing we had in the many long time ago in a discussion on this one, if we would take this seriously, that means logic would already imply hard determinism. And we know that Epicurus was not a fan of hard determinism. Those are almost the kind of statements, Martin, that stun us into silence because they're so pregnant with meaning and deep. This is definitely something for us to discuss more at length in the forum, but it underlies a lot of other issues, Epicurus's attitude towards logic and so forth. This would probably be a prime example of why Epicurus was so cautious about it. And the example about being forced to give an answer to the question of Hermarchus will either be alive or dead tomorrow sounds almost exactly to me like what you just said, Martin, that logic does not apply to predictions of future events in the real world. And that's a shocking statement to say something like that without understanding some of the depth of what's being said. And perhaps the real ramification of it is that there are people who attempt to reason that way through philosophy, that you can take questions of morals and ethics and apply a strictly logical, strictly deterministic approach to it. If I am courageous, I will be a good person. As you said, timeless. They're attempting to take concepts of virtue and apply them in a real world in a way that it's just impossible to do. And I'm grasping at straws by trying to describe things that way. It's really fascinating. Yeah, I think Martin hit it right in the head there. That was that was perfect. I'm going to read this from Wikipedia. As a demonstration of the principle, consider two contradictory statements. All lemons are yellow and not all lemons are yellow. And suppose that both are true. This is exactly the Hermarchus Her um, case, just stated differently, really. If that is the case, anything can be proven. For example, the assertion that unicorns exist by using the following argument. One, we know that not all lemons are yellow as it has been assumed to be true. Two, we know that all lemons are yellow is that has been assumed to be true. Therefore, the two-part statement, all lemons are yellow or unicorns exist, must also be true, since the first part, all lemons are yellow, of the two-part statement is true, as this has been assumed. However, since we know that not all lemons are yellow, as this has been assumed, the first part is false, and hence the second part must be true to ensure the two-part statement to be true i.e. unicorns exist. Quad erat demonstrandum. It's, it's absurdity that just elevates itself. It's ridiculous, is, is a way to put it. It doesn't apply fully here because that is an end statement. And what is here is Hamarchus will be alive or dead. So, so it doesn't fully apply here. Well, you could just rephrase this by saying all lemons are yellow or all lemons are not yellow and just follow it that way. But yeah, you're, you're probably right. You would have to restructure it differently. It's problematic, I think, no matter how you look at it. And that was exactly the kind of wordplay Lo that Epicurus <laughs> didn't seem to have a lot of time for. Uh, logic chopping, as I think. Logic uh, chopping, exactly. <laughs> Shakespeare in, in Hamlet refers to it. And we've also got that good example in Seneca where he's talking about Epicurus and then also complaining about mice and cheese and how. Do you remember that one, Joshua, how that one goes? Cheese is a word, so right. logically, mice eat a word. Does that make sense? Right. Yes, that's the direction it goes. Yeah. And we'll come to the end of that line of discussion probably right now. But this issue of attempting to use strictly logical analysis to predict future events, to apply morality into the future, is an ex extremely hazardous endeavor. Epicurus was pointing in the opposite direction. He was saying to be more practical about it and do your best to predict what's going to happen if you make one choice versus what's going to happen if you make another choice. And, and that's the best you can do. Speaking of choosing and avoiding, that's that's where we come <laughs> to. That's an way. Way. nicely that. done. And Don, I gathered that this was, as it were, part of the reason you're here with us today is you have some thoughts on this. 
Yeah, I'll let Cash just give the introduction, and then I'll, uh, I'll chime in with a couple things myself. The next section is indeed on choosing and avoiding. The main point made by DeWitt is that these words of choose, avoid, and so forth is a different way of looking at things. In modern world, we often talk about willpower or will and so forth. But that's not the direction that the Greeks were thinking about these things. Yeah, I, it's sort of my, my hobby horse, I think, because the book where Epicurus talks about what's traditionally called choosing and avoiding is peri hyresion kai pugon. And those two words, hyresion and pugon, are the ones that are translated as choosing and avoiding. But the hyresion, I think, is interesting because it comes down to us as the origin of the word heresy. So those people who were choosing for themselves were seen as heretics in the early church. So I think that's interesting. It also has a, a, the idea of like pursuing something. So it's not just a choice. It's something that you, you actively pursue. The things that you want to do, you pursue them. Pugo is the one that annoys me the most, I think, because it's often translated almost exclusively as avoidance or avoiding. And it really means more like to flee or to take flight from something or to escape from something. So it's a much more active word to me. I usually translate it in whenever I post things on the forum as, as choosing and rejecting because it's a much more active sort of thing that whenever somebody says avoid, I always think of like stepping around a mud puddle. It's a very mundane sort of thing, whereas it seems to me that Epicurus is really saying that you either pursue something or you flee from something. And that sort of gives, at least in my mind, a little bit more of the the impact and a little bit more of the importance of of these these ideas that you're not just you're not just choosing and avoiding things. You're, you're pursuing something or you're actively, you know, fleeing from it or escaping from it. Yeah, and Epicurus says elsewhere that um, we should flee from our bad habits as if they were grievous men or uh, if, if they were angry men who had done us grievous harm. Exactly, exactly. And, and it, it would be a whole other you know, connotation to that if you say you just, you just avoid your habits. You know, it, it, it just those, those English words, I think, have such semantic baggage with them that, you know, to, to just choose and avoid, it just seems like there should be something something stronger there in the English whenever we talk about those words. Don, can you tell me the, the word for avoiding again? Pugo. So it would be a P-H. If, if, it, if we transliterate it, it's P-H-E-U-G-O. Fugo or okay. Pugo or actually Fevgo, I think, is the, is the modern Greek pronunciation of it. OK. <laughs> Does that come down to us in any similar English? Was, you know, it could, could very well be the uh, the exclamation pew whenever you escape from something. <laughs> I, I was going to suggest pugilism, which is boxing where you're parrying and evading and oh i'd have to look that one up that's a good uh, that's a good idea that's that's, that's a possibility but no i think it comes from the latin pugnus pugnus oh, which, means, right, right, which right. means fist so completely unrelated. that makes sense that makes sense well several of the things you said don play into transition into the next subheading the heading title is the double choice but what dewitt is saying here is somewhat what you were saying a moment ago don that in addition to basically making choices between individual actions or individual specific things, what DeWitt is emphasizing here is that Epicurus thought it was important to have a choice of attitude. And the way DeWitt says it, there's a clear distinction between choosing an attitude, diathesis, toward an action in a given sphere, and choosing to do or not to do a given thing within that field. What he's talking about here is that a lot of the principal doctrines and the way things are presented seem to be structured in a way as to inoculate students against other ideas, but basically a position that if you understand a general observation in a field, such as the idea that the gods are not supernatural and that they're not going to reward and punish you and that they live a blissful existence of their own without concern for lesser beings like us, it, if once you accept a perspective in a particular field, that's going to serve as your attitude, which maybe this fits into the pattern recognition of prolepsis. It's going to lead you in your direction of evaluating the specifics within that field so that you're both making choices not only as to a specific particular event, but you're also making choices as to your general attitude or your general approach towards a particular topic that's of concern to you such as the gods or fortune or necessity or politics. You know, we have a general attitude that political involvement is a bad idea in terms of at least wanting to have a career as a politician and spending all of your time at the mercy of other people. 
the point being that circumstances will ultimately determine how you make individual decisions, but you'll have an attitude that will represent your general sum of your perspective towards it. And Lucian and Alexander, the oracle monger, Lucian makes the comment that this person who was very skeptical of Alexander, who was defrauding people through his religious pretensions, that an Epicurus would have been sure that even if he did not understand the precise way that the fraud was being committed, that he was confident that it was fraud because he understood the general nature that there are no supernatural gods. Yeah, that's an interesting section just because it really gives the idea that we do have freedom to believe what we want to believe, that we can change our our beliefs, we can change our empty beliefs into beliefs that have more of a foundation, that sort of thing. But then that also carries over to using what we choose to believe in general into specific situations. So I think that the way DeWitt phrases that is kind of kind of interesting. He uses the example, the proper attitude towards food is to prefer a simple diet. But this does not preclude, and it even approves, an occasional indulgence. Which is neither exactly is, what uh, Emily Austin said. Yes, neither is political life to be avoided under all circumstances. The evil is not in such a life itself, but in the surrendering freedom by making a career of it. Thus, in spite of the choices of attitude, the necessity of making the individual choice is perpetual. I guess that point there would be that you don't generally end up revising your major attitudes once you've decided right. which ones are correct. But in the individual moment, you may have to, to take some action, just as we sometimes choose pain in order to pursue right. pleasure. Ultimately, we have to be aware of the context of the circumstances and live in the real world as opposed to living in some abstraction. I always quote this John Locke letter on this point, his letter concerning toleration. He wrote it anonymously in Latin and published it in the Netherlands because he didn't want didn't want too many people to read it. It was it was quite groundbreaking for the time. He was advocating for extreme religious toleration in a time when that was quite dangerous to do. And he says that true religion consists in the inward and full persuasion of the mind and that faith is not faith without believing. And for me, this is an area I continue to struggle with, and I mentioned it recently, is this idea of, is it possible to really choose what you believe? And since we're talking about free will, this seems like an important subject. And the way I always uh, sort of tie it in with Epicureanism is in this quote in the letter to Minoikius, right, where he says, accustom yourself to believe that death is nothing to you. People struggle with this. It's not like they can just flip a switch in their brain and go, okay. Now I believe that death is nothing to me. It's something you have to think about and wrestle with. You have to put new information before your eyes. You have to consider things, weigh them in your mind before you can come to what Epicurus thought was the right conclusion. And I think that's how it works, I, I guess. I don't know. I don't think it's easy to change what you believe, right? Just like I couldn't suddenly start believing in leprechauns if I wanted to. Wait, what? There's no leprechauns? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it really yeah. changes the case. Uh, so, for example, in, in science, you may r more easily change uh, what you, what, what you um, I mean, I actually don't like to talk belief in, this, in the context of science, but in common, it is used in there that scientists will believe something on what they research on. And uh, when they see the evidence, that can be instantaneously convincing to change uh, the belief. You know? Right. And, and that's in, in that domain, the whole point really is to attempt to prove your hypothesis wrong by testing it. That is not the only thing we do. So so I found in my practical world, ju just uh, seeing it is already quite convincing. Uh, of, of course, if we want to publish a work and prove something, we need to put it typically in the form, as you say, so that we design of a, a crucial experiment, uh, which can, depending on the outcome, can refute. Uh, what what we claim uh, that is correct but in practice most of the research actual re research work done and what, what we see in the laboratory is is actually straightforward so that we see directly what we want to look at and that we do not do a refutation attempt right and people do change their mind all the time and and i mean public opinion polling on on any issue under the sun can demonstrate this fact maybe it's a question more about do you have to have a desire to change your mind before you change your mind? And I don't know that that's true either. I think that some things are so overwhelmingly apparent at times that you can't help but change your mind about them. But it is a difficult issue, I think.
Yeah, there's a lot of, when it comes to belief systems, there's a lot of acculturation and education and indoctrination and all those sorts of words that have to do with why you believe a certain thing. And sometimes it's hard to pull down those walls if you want to try and believe something different. Or when when the walls are pulled down to put them back up again. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, good point. Okay, the reference to walls takes us into the next section, freedom and necessity. He begins the discussion basically by talking about something that I'm not very familiar with, Greek tragedy and how it related to Greek religion and so forth. There was a lot of what he calls fatalism in Homer and in the Greek attitudes towards things, which Dewitt says was refined in the tragedies that came later, but did not really reject the traditional fatalism. He cites the phrase that many of us have heard, uh, quote, whom the gods destroy, they first drive insane. Yeah, and it brings up Oedipus there again as well, which is, uh, again, as we mentioned earlier, that he, w- he was always going to marry his mother and kill his father no matter what acts he tried to do. And, and the appointment in Samar, I think, is a great illustration of that, too, Joshua, the okay. idea of not being able to outrun your fate. Everybody knows the Oedipus complex, I think, is a phrase people throw around. But as far as what the theme of the play is and so forth, I did not realize that it was a fate issue. Yeah, that was one of the reasons that Oedipus's parents tried to to get rid of him as he, when he was a baby, because it was prophesied that he would kill his father and marry his mother. And they were like, well, we can't have this. So they tried to. But then it was, of course, the whole, you know, somebody picks him up in the in the woods and raises him. And then he becomes, you know, king in another city. And then he meets his father on the road and he doesn't know it's his father. And they get into an argument and they kill him and it goes back. And then he doesn't realize that his mother is there. So it's this whole thing where you know, he tries to his parents try to, to outrun fate. And, you know, Oedipus is aware of this. And and then there's a, a whole plague afflicting the city where Oedipus is king and they're like you know why is this happening and you know I'm going Oedipus says I'm going to find out and then he finds out that oh I've married my mother and killed my father. Oedipus's name literally means swollen foot when his father received the oracle um, when he was born that he would kill his father and marry his mother he bound the baby by his feet and as you said Don left him in the woods to die and he was taken in by a farmer. And then it all ends up with his beard bedecked by eyeballs so (laughs) That's one of the great lines. (laughs) So Oedipus is a Greek story. It was originally a myth. And then, of course, the the Greek tragedians took it and ran with the story. And it's, you know, through various cycles and his children and that sort of thing. So there's a whole there's a whole Oedipus cycle in the the Greek tragedies that, that has to do with Oedipus and what happens to him and his children. And it quite the house of horrors there. And that predates Epicurus and therefore be something he'd be familiar with? Oh, by all means. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Greek, the Greek tragedies and stuff were. Aristophanes was writing plays about, you know, I think it was, was it um, Euripides and Sophocles debating each other in Hades and this sort of thing. So it was, it, was, it was very much a sort of a just in the mix in Greek culture at the time. But that's exactly the kind of fatalism that, that Epicurus would have railed against. And I hesitate to bring this up, but I, I was reading, as I mentioned last night, about the whole free will debates and that sort of thing. And that there seems to be a subtle but important distinction between fatalism and determinism is from what I'm seeing in the current debates going around about free will. And I, I think that there is it's an interesting topic just because determinism is the word it's always used in discussing this with, with Epicurus and Democritus and, and all that. But it almost seems to it would be more fatalism than it is determinism sometimes. So it's, it's I don't know whether anyone else has, has dived into the deep end of that pool or not, but it, it, the, whole, the whole difference between fatalism and determinism, I think, is an interesting possibility to, to explore down the road. The, the fatalism is essentially then the wrong attitude you may get if you believe in hard determinism, but, but it's not necessary. Go, go, go that way. So, so it's again choice. And uh, uh, whereas, uh, so fatalism is basically not something that uh, uh, you characterize the physics, it's just a person's attitude. And determ- determ- determinism would be then an issue of metaphysics. Yeah. I'm looking at a, I'm looking at an infographic that was online um, that I had found last night. And this is just, just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sort of describe the whole thing, but the, some of the, the points that are, are here is that determinism is dependent on causality and fatalism is not dependent on causality. Determinism says the future is causally determined and fatalism is the future is fated or destined. So there are causes that have to do with determinism, whereas fatalism is, you know, it's nothing is going to change 
what what happens in the end. So it sounds like determinism holds out a little bit. Uh, you know, determinism does not lead to defeatism as our conscious thought and action leads to future events. So there's an inter like I said, it's an interesting um, an interesting way to look at things. Yeah, determinism often is often a secular understanding of causality, and fatalism is often a religious idea of being fated by a deity or God. So there's subtle yet distinct differences there. And I would say this is where we serve a role of hopefully being helpful to people in pointing out where the rabbit trails are that you go down <laughs> and never come out of versus where the practical issues really hit the road. Because as we've seen proof, there's an endless amount of reading that you can do among modern exactly. philosophers and everyone about these issues. And, and you get this, into these technical terms that may or may not be helpful to regular people who basically just need to understand. It's really sort of an attitude of fatalism that there's nothing you can do to affect your right. future. You're just absolutely hopeless and you get depressed and you crawl into your hole and do nothing. That's the practical result of an improper understanding of where you fit in the universe, according to Epicurus. And it's that practical result that he's combating. He's not necessarily, and this is a comment I think that Sedley brings up about the swerve. Nobody's really going to take the position that saying that the atom swerve is a full and complete definitional mechanism to understand everything that flows into human activity. But it is a sort of a touchstone or, or perspective that gives you something to hang on to when you ultimately come up with your final attitude that you do have the ability to control some of your actions and you'd better use that control to live as happily as you can because otherwise you're going to waste your life. On 175, there's a paragraph where DeWitt goes into this. He says that the physicist had been busy erecting an edifice of thought in which the end result was a kind of fatalism, even more shocking to the sensibilities of Epicurus. We still possess his pronouncement upon the topic. This is what we quoted earlier from the letter to Menorchus. It would be better to follow the myths concerning the gods than to be a slave to the necessity of the physicists. For the former presumes some hope of appeasement through worship of the gods, while the latter presumes an inexorable necessity. The crime of the physicists, in his judgment, had been their failure to deal with the problem of freedom. And their offense was at its worst in the case of the atomist, who found the sole cause of motion and change in the universe to be the motion of the atoms. On this point, the feelings of Epicurus were so intense that he denied to Lysippus even the name of a philosopher. And part of the reason I mentioned that is there's, there's this controversy out there about Lysippus, who had been, I think, a predecessor of Democritus in the discussion of atomism. And apparently Epicurus said something that some people interpret as saying that Lysippus did not even exist, that he was a fantasy. I've seen other people, and it may be DeWitt, it may be others, who take the position that what Epicurus was saying was not that Lysippus was a fictional character, but that Lysippus was so wrong and so out there in his misinterpretation of atomism that he did not even deserve the name of a philosopher. The point being in all that is that this was something that was really intensely of concern to Epicurus, not just as a debating point, but for the practical result that if you feel fatalistic, that you have no ability to control your future whatsoever, then none of the rest of it is going to make any difference of philosophy or anything else. You're just going to be basically immobilized. I think that's a word that he uses in the next paragraph. It's almost like you're the classic deer in the headlights if you begin to be so overcome by this feeling of hopelessness and helplessness that you can take no additional action. That's really, I think, where Epicurus is going with all of this rather than sort of a medical or physical attempt to explain everything. I just see that fatalism comes with two different meanings. So uh, the, way, uh, the one I referred to was the attitude but I think what is mostly discussed here is really the fatalism as, as again, a, a category in, in metaphysics. Yeah, DeWitt says that it may be interposed here that the concept of determinism is not offensive to the intellectualist. I think people listening to our podcast will understand where he's coming from there. People who are extremely educated and into the science of all this, they don't have a problem with talking about determinism. It doesn't lead them into immediately wanting to go out and cut their wrists because they're familiar with the topic and they understand the ins and outs of it. But as Dewitt goes on, he says, 
it was consequently the duty of Epicurus as a moralist, a reformer, and hence a pragmatist, or in the ancient parlance, as a truly wise man who will be more powerfully moved by his feelings than other men to declare the significance of determinism for human conduct. His verdict was that determinism meant paralysis. His solution was to postulate a sufficient degree of freedom of the motion of the atoms to permit the freedom of the individual, and that's where the swerve comes from. But again, that's just a restatement that this is a very significant issue and not just a a sideline. We may very well have to talk about this in another episode, of course, but there are, at least in modern philosophical discussions, people who will say that if we knew the position of every atom from the beginning of the universe that we would be able to predict your actions with 100 percent accuracy i mean that that is a position out there that free will does not exist in any way shape or form that people think of it and that the atoms are completely determined and if we had enough uh, computing power we could predict everybody's actions with a 100 percent accuracy and that that is a that is a position where a number of modern philosophers and neuroscientists have come down including i think people like Sam Harris and things like that. So there, there is a that whole those whole couple of paragraphs there. Definitely, there is a a strong position that some have taken that say exactly that that, that you know that everything all your actions are necessitated and you don't don't have anything that is like free will. And I was going to say, as Calcini, you had mentioned you wanted to add something. Yeah. So actually, I read Sam Harris's book. I think the title it does say something free will, but I can't remember the exact title. But I went down the rabbit hole regarding the idea of free will. Do we have free will? And yes, it sounds, if you read what other writers have said about free will, you can suddenly feel like, oh my God, maybe I don't have free will. But guess what? That does not help you live a good life. And if, as you are in a given situation, any kind of challenging situation, you're going to have a better outcome if you hold the belief that you have choices and you have the power to make choices and to take action. So I think it's very, very important to take an attitude that you do have a certain amount of free will and you're just going to have a much better life. You're going to have, you're going to have more options come to you As you're analyzing a situation, your mind will be able to see the world in a more open way, in a more positive way. You'll be able to make much better choices because you have more options and it will result in a better life. Yeah, well put. Well put. And and from my understanding, that 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 basic idea is where the compatibilists, uh, what mm-hmm. they call themselves, the modern ones come with Daniel Dennett and, and people like that, that it, it's, you know, even even if, you know, maybe there's some sort of, you know, deterministic thing in, in atoms and stuff that it, free will is still a, a, a very useful way of looking at the world. So it, it, it's, yeah, it, it is definitely, you know, put your miner's helmet on with the light whenever you go down that rabbit hole, because it's, it is a, a long and winding road to mix some metaphors there. Yeah. The reasoning of the hard determinists is actually cannot be upheld. It's against empiricism because you, can, you, 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 you need many more atoms than there are in the universe to build that computer. That means you, you cannot build that computer. <laughs> so there's no empirical way to make this. Make this. So I mean, that claim of hard determinism cannot be, can neither be verified nor be, nor, nor be refuted. So, so it, it's just a belief thing. No? Oh, that's that's a very good way of putting it. That that that's very interesting. I I, I like that. What I was going to say, particularly about Sam Harris, because I I used to listen to his podcast, was that some of the conclusions that that these guys, um, that these academics, intellectuals, um, d- draw from their idea of determinism, some of them sound quite attractive. And one of them is the idea that if no one has any choice in what they do, then shouldn't we? And here's the inherent paradox, isn't it? That <laughs> That if no one has the choice in what they do, then shouldn't we be more understanding and compassionate of people who, for example, fall on the wrong side of the law? Right. Right. You know, everything should be focused toward rehabilitation rather than just punishment. And that sounds quite good. Mm -hmm. Um, But as I said, the impending paradox immediately is how do we choose to be more compassionate 
if we don't have a choice in the matter. So it's <laughs> it's Im- immediately it's a thorny question. But I think part of the reason that some of this stuff is appealing to people is because of issues like that one. It, it sounds... <laughs> Um, the way they frame it, quite attractive in some ways. Interestingly enough, I was reading about that too, and they said, you know, not only is it not, you you can't really, it, it, you take this to its logical, quote unquote, logical conclusion, and that you can't um, assign blame to anybody for, for the actions that they've done, but conversely, you also can't praise anybody for what they've done because they were, you know, it, they were determined to do that anyway. So if somebody runs into a building and saves children, it's like, oh, that, that's great. You know, thanks for doing that. But, you know, you, you would have done that anyway. So, so with praise and blame are, you know, sort of like almost taken out of the equation, it seems. Yeah, again, on the legal system. So that means uh, it would be perfectly okay to do not do any punishment, but still to throw people in jail for life, just protect the others who are, who, who are not likely to commit uh, serious crimes. Ne? So, so that means, uh, so that then the reasoning becomes no, no more completely at all punishment, just rather protection of the majority. Yeah, good point. Good point. And, and that all sort of, at least in my mind, comes back to the whole idea of Epicurean justice with the you know, to neither harm nor be harmed. And so if you're harming people that it's like, well, you know, if you're a hard determinist, well, we, we can't really blame you for that. We've we got to put you away to protect the other people in, in society. So, yeah, exactly what you were saying. There was a film a number of years ago. I think I was in high school at the time starring Tom Cruise called Minority Report. And this was like a sci fi dystopian future in which they could predict, you know, everything was predetermined, obviously, and they could predict who was going to commit a crime. And they would arrest and punish them uh, prematurely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then put them in like some sort of suspended animation or something. Or just saying, we're not, not going to kill you. We're just going to like, you know, take you out of society. Yeah. It really is. I mean, the whole, you know, the whole free will thing, I think, is a really interesting debate. I think it has so many ramifications for, for an individual's life. I think that it is. You know, really important for people to wrap their brains around it. I think it's also important to see what the current science says. The one of the experiments that they keep bringing up with the free will debate is that they've done experiments where your your brain actually fires to provoke an action before you're you're conscious of it. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's interesting. You know, but it's still your own biology that's initiating that action. You have to be conscious of it for it to have been a you know quote unquote choice. Does it? I mean. You know, w- w- at what point in the continuum does, you know, making a choice actually come in, you know, actually pursuing something? Where does it come in into the you know, whether whether your neurons fire before you're, you know, quote unquote conscious of it? Does that still negate the idea of you having made a choice to follow that path or does it mean that it was determined? And I, I'm not entirely convinced. I was you know, reading more about that, like I said, last night, and I'm like, I'm still not entirely convinced that it it completely negates the idea of. A general idea of free will so it's but again it's a we keep using the word rabbit hole and i can't think of any any better any better metaphor for it it looks me to me that this kind of experiment is simply overinterpreted. so that means in yeah. certain situations where people then expect that in certain choice of reactions to happen then this this can very very be the case because then we operate just with a, with the brain stem and basically do this automatically before consciousness uh, we consciously do this but in most our actions we do uh, we ponder before about it i mean non-trivial actions no? we mm-hmm. ponder about this before so so that means it's very obvious that uh, we, we spent a long time before consciously uh, thinking about this so that means this experiment does not apply to to these cases that's a very good point because most of the times what they're doing is they're either like you know you know, if a if a letter comes up on this, you know, I I'm just paraphrasing basically, but you know, if a if a number comes up on the screen, hit this button. If a letter comes up on the screen, hit this button, and then they see that the neurons are firing before the the action is actually taken. You know, that there's a conscious decision to press whichever button, and that's extrapolated out. And I think you make a really good point, Martin, about that those aren't necessarily the kinds of decisions where people say that, you know. You know, whether you have free will, whether you're going to hit a button before a letter or a number shows up on the screen, at least in my mind, doesn't necessarily equate to you know making decisions about which which careers to take or which steps to take in in this situation. So that I I think the overinterpretation that you said is is a really good point to keep in mind. 
We've covered a lot of fascinating material in the last few minutes, <laughs> and we're probably going to be coming to the end of the episode before long. But let me throw in this at, at this point, perhaps targeted mostly back at what Calasini said, but also several things that other people said were, are relevant as well. That going back again to the David Sedley article, who is someone I'm always very glad to bring in and support of a position that DeWitt takes. Again, Epicurus's reputation of determinism is the name of the article, and he's talking about how Epicurus was responding to this idea that if you believe in atomism, you're going to believe in a billiard ball form of hard determinism. I want to read this because I think it's particularly well worded. Sedley says this, quote, Epicurus's response to this is perhaps the least appreciated aspect of his thought. It was to reject reductionist atomism. Almost uniquely among Greek philosophers, he arrived at what is nowadays the unreflective assumption of almost anyone with a smattering of science, that there are truths at the microscopic level of elementary particles, and further, very different truths at the phenomenal level, that the former must be capable of explaining the latter, but that neither level of description has a monopoly of truth. The truth that sugar is sweet is not straightforwardly reducible to the truth that it has such and such a molecular structure, even though the latter truth may be required in order to explain the former. By establishing that cognitive skepticism, the direct outcome of reductionist atomism, is self-refuting and untenable in practice, Epicurus justifies his non-reductionist alternative according to which sensations are true and therefore bona fide truths at the phenomenal level accessible through them. And so he continues on a little bit further there, but this issue that at neither level, neither the microscopic nor the phenomenal level, neither one of those levels has a monopoly on truth. They are both true. Mm -hmm. One explains the other to some extent to us, but they can't be allowed to contradict each other because if you take the basic attitudinal perspective that both are true, you don't get caught at the bottom of the rabbit hole and unable to finally come up again. There's not a war between the level at which we live and the level of our understanding of the atomic movement of the particles. One helps us explain the other, but they are both true to us. Yeah, and it always goes back to that. It, it goes back to that Democritean thing about you know sugar is sweet by convention, but mm -hmm. in the end, atoms and void. And both both things can be true. It's not it's not an either or. And I, I had a um, I had a, I took some notes last night on Sedley's article, and the line that I put in my notes here was uh, according to Sedley, an Epicurus's view, matter in certain complex states can take on non physical properties which in turn bring genuinely new behavioral laws into operation. So he's he's talking that, I mean, basically saying that Epicurus had the idea of emergent properties of matter, basically. I'm so glad you brought that up. And we're probably not going to be able to trace that to a conclusion today. We'll probably bring it up next week. But Don, I also thought that was extremely significant because he's showing examples. He discussed the fact that a rock versus a leaf if you throw a rock into a pond, it will sink. If you throw a leaf into a pond, it will float on the surface. That is an example of the emergent body controlling the reality of the atoms that are the components within it. In other words, the atoms within the rock are going to sink. The atoms within the leaf are going to float. They are being affected by the emergent aspect right. in the way they have combined. And if you think about it like that, it's it's obvious that at this emergent level of humanity at which we're living, we are affecting the atoms that are within us in the, yep. in the sense that they are in a particular place at a particular time at a particular configuration because we act in a way that brings that about. So again, I always come back to that. It's in the New Testament where Paul is complaining about those people who think that we are the slaves of the weak and beggarly elements, that we are just totally at the mercy of what the elements would tell us to do as if they're God's constantly giving us commands. Well, the point that Don has just brought up is that we too, at our level of being an emergent property of the atoms, are influencing the atoms. It's not just totally a one-way street. 
which is incredibly basic and obvious to think about. But I do think for the same reason that Don made that observation, I think it's significant, too. We're not just slaves of the atom. Maybe this is the point we should close on today, because I was flagging it because I felt sure that Joshua probably has a comment on it. At the bottom of 175, DeWitt is talking about, for the sake of a closer analysis, it's worthwhile to observe at this point that Epicurus, having put the mythologist and the physicist in a single class as teachers of fatalism, wishes to see the new order of his own system as governed by the laws of nature, Fidera Naturae, Fidera Naturae, as opposed to the laws of fate, Fidera Fati, and Consequently, the new freedom he was offering to mankind, quote, had been wrestled from the fates. In an infinite universe dominated by these physical laws, man is miraculously exempt. The point of all that being that there's an attitude of the laws of fate have us in its iron grip from which we cannot escape, but that if we see that there's not really laws of fate that control us, but laws of nature that we can work within and even have influence over, we see that there is freedom within which we can work to have a happier life. Yeah, and one of the things I loved about that Sedley article is that we get more words of Epicurus himself because Sedley's done the hard work of looking at the Herculaneum papyri and yes. that sort of thing. And I wrote down one of the one of the sections here. We so rarely get to talk about Epicurus's words other than the letters of Herodotus and Pythocles and Minoicus and that sort of thing. So Epicurus, he quotes Epicurus as saying, uh, talking about people and their behavior, he says, for the nature of their atoms has contributed nothing to some of their behavior and degrees of behavior and attitudes, but it is their developments which themselves possess all or most of the responsibility for certain things. It is as a result of that nature that some of their atoms move with disordered motions, but is not on the atoms that all the responsibility should be placed for their behavior. And that's it's another thing talking about the whole idea of emergent properties coming from from the mm -hmm. configuration of your atoms. Okay, boy, we are ending on a very deep but extremely productive area, I think. And we have yet to even address, uh, I, I don't want to, we're certainly not going to finish the chapter until we come back and talk about Sedley's arguments about how the determinism and skepticism arguments are self-refuting, because there's really fascinating material that Sedley writes there to give examples of that. They're fairly technical, and they're going to take some explanation, but I think they're fascinating, and I don't think they're things we've generally talked about. But in the interest of time and to stay connected with reality, we have to realize that we are probably about to expend our allotted time. So let's go around and take closing comments, and maybe we can entice Don to come back with us next week, or we'll do it at a time when he can, because this is a really fascinating uh, discussion, and hopefully we can get some more input from everybody on it. Of course, we're only halfway or so through the chapter. We have a lot more to go. But let's go for closing comments right now. So, Martin, closing comments for today. So, so we will continue at the bottom of 170, page 175. So let's re resume here next week. Okay. All right. Who's next? Calasini? Uh, yeah, this has been an interesting podcast. I enjoyed it. And also Don's comment about the word regarding avoidances and interpretation of saying flee rather than avoid. That was kind of interesting. And I was hoping, Don, that you could maybe post on that on the forum a bit. Maybe it's already there, but I'd be curious to be able to read more about that on the forum. By all means, I can definitely add it to the show notes. Great, thanks. I have a quote that I was, I was going to read from uh, Stephen Greenblatt on The Swerve. This comes from chapter 10 of that book. He's been describing a book by Giordano Bruno in which he's taking to task this idea that everything is ordained by God. And this is his conclusion. He says, once you take seriously the claim that God's providence extends to the fall of a sparrow and the number of hairs on your head, there is virtually no limit from the agitated dust motes in a beam of sunlight to the planetary conjunctions that are occurring in the heavens above. The whole thing does not work that way. There is no artificer God standing outside the universe, barking commands, meeting out rewards and punishments, determining everything. The whole idea is absurd. There is an order in the universe, but it is one built into the nature of things, into the matter that composes everything from stars to men to bedbugs. 
Nature is not an abstract capacity, but a generative mother bringing forth everything that exists. We have, in other words, entered the Lucretian universe. That is the end of a, of a passage in which he's quoting um, Giordano Bruno in uh, Ingrid D. Rowland's translation of a book called On the Triumphant Beast, <laughs> or The Expulsion of the Triumphant Beast, sorry. And, and it's, it's a very long passage um, from Giordano Bruno in which he's describing how Mercury at the behest of Jove has to account for how many dung beetles are, are in the yard and how many <laughs> how many teeth fall out of this old lady's mouth and how many hairs fall off of a young lady's head when she is using the, the curling iron and, and and it goes on and on and on but that's very much the point of the passage there's there's too much uh, to be done and it's not done <laughs> by any outside force or, or any god or, or jove and mercury um working all this out it's built into the nature of reality anyway it's a great chapter from a book i really really like so great chapter from a great book yeah and didn't lucian write something about Zeus being overwhelmed by the number of prayers people were asking, and it was just, you know, he couldn't keep up with everything. And there was a whole whole thing similar to that, that there was just there was just too much to do for any one god to be in charge of it all. That's great. I need to go back and read the swerve at some point. So many books, so little time. And now it's your time for closing comments. Uh, thank you again for uh, having me back. This is a very uh, intellectually stimulating conversation and has inspired me to go back and, and read some more things and sort of get a better grasp on this and really, really know what I believe myself. So it's it's a this is a good um, impetus for that. So so this was a very, uh, very interesting. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing the comments on the forum. And I'll close by saying how much I appreciate everybody's participation today. This is a fascinating subject. And as you get into it and discuss it at this kind of level, you can see how important it is to us and how important it was to Epicurus. And although we don't really discuss it that much in our day-to-day issues and discussions of Epicurus, it's it's a really a critical issue to bring out. And it's something I hope that we're able to communicate through the podcast and bring perhaps a different perspective that people haven't thought about in a long time in their studies of Epicurus. I think that's largely what we're doing in our work at the podcast and the Epicurean Friends Group is to stimulate the study of Epicurus at a deeper level than most people generally are thinking about it. Because there's so much there to bring out that doesn't deserve to be buried in the obscurity that it's been for so long. And so we invite everyone to come by the forum and discuss this and any of our other topics. And let us know your comments, questions, suggestions for future episodes. And with that, we'll come back next week. So thanks, everybody, and see you then. Bye.